Well, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the Deering Banjo Masterclass this afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for everybody joining us today. Um, I'm normally in my office doing Deering Live, but today I thought a change of scenery might be uh, might be good. Um, but uh, yeah, this is going to be fun. Um, many of you will probably remember kind of January 2021, we started a little show called the Deering Banjo Masterclass uh, with Jens Kruger. Um, and we thought... Jens isn't done yet. He's got plenty more to say. Um, let's see if we can't get him back on and uh, let's do a few more episodes. So we're going to start uh, today uh, exploring um, backup ideas and concepts for multiple uh, styles. Now, for those of you that are familiar with Jens, uh, he's been a part of the Deering family for a long, long time. Um, he is probably one of the best banjo players alive today. Uh, a extremely incredible multi-instrumentalist and a very, very accomplished composer to boot. So his take and his approach to music and philosophy is such that even if you're not a banjo player, and this is one of the things I always loved about listening into these classes, as a musician, you can always take something away from it and learn. And I think that's really important. Um, so we'll get to get with the ends in just a second. Um, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, uh, there's you can... Um, talk in the chat. There's a bunch of us here. Um, go back and forth. Uh, and then I would encourage you, uh, we've had numerous discussions with Jens uh, on Deering Live, our sister live stream. Um, and I would encourage you to go back and watch those uh, if you haven't already and to watch the previous episodes of the Masterclass. Um, but for right now, I think there's not a lot more to do other than to bring him in, the man himself, Mr. Jens Kruger. Well, how hello. are you? <laughs> I'm doing <laughs> very well. Over here. Yes, I'm very well. Thank you, Jamie. It's uh, so nice to be back on Deering Life and um, ha have an opportunity, uh, have an opportunity to share um, uh, some ideas, you know, and things about banjo playing. We just uh, we just had our academy uh, last week, and we had yeah. a lot of people come to uh, Wilkesboro to to learn or you know jam and have a good time. And so I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit in the teaching mood. So, <laughs> well, I, I think you could have picked a better time. So, so because this is the first episode in a while, I'll just before I, I hand it over to you, yes, yes, this is this yes. is not a Deering Live episode where there's an interview. I'm going to step out in a minute, and you're going to take flight and and do what you do best, which is to, you know, pass on your knowledge and your expertise to to people who want to absorb that. That's going to be what did you say, 30, 40 minutes, maybe? Well, maybe, we'll... yeah, I guess about thirty minutes, and then yeah. we go into some question answers. You know, that would be great. That sounds great. So, anyone watching again, please, if you have questions along the way, drop them into the chat for me. I'll be moderating, and then I'll come back in um, in about thirty minutes or so, and uh, we'll answer as many as we can. So, Jens, always a pleasure to see you, my friend. Uh, I'll Thank leave you. it with you. All have right, fun, guys. All right. Thank you. I, I, for this part, I can take my headphones off because I don't need to hear um, <laughs> anybody talk to me. So uh, this is this is this is. Fun. I look, I look okay. <laughs> so so I want to start off. You know, this is about backup. Now backup means that um, you you play with with somebody and you're not in a solo position. So you're not you're not playing solo and you're maybe not singing lead. You're sort of in the you know in a band or in a duo and and there's some there's music going on and now what are you going to do with the banjo and uh, of course when we look at the traditional uh, uh, banjo playing um, I don't know you remember you know Janet Janet Davis was fantastic she had a lot of books you know about about backup and bluegrass backup backup which I highly recommend because she's just awesome the way she done it and her daughter I think is continuing with that but I want to just um, go through a few a few of these basic concepts, not only the techniques, but why these are there. Now, when we start off just in the beginning, you know, uh, back up um, uh, before Earl Scruggs, even with the band, you know, it would be strumming chords, you know, uh, along with everybody else. And um, even even the five string band, you know, with uh, a string bean, when he played with, with Bill Monroe, he would play claw hammer and he would just play the chords, you know, while while everybody was else was playing the same, the same chords. Now, when you uh, um, uh, when you look at backup, you know that's 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 in in um, in swing music or such. You know you have little things like, for instance, the 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 singer sings and then he stops singing, and there's these little pauses. And in these little pauses, you know, the big band would throw in, you know, some 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 just figure, you know, some musical idea. And the reason for that is to just bring the attention away from the singer into the band. 
and then back to the singer again, you know, have something little interesting going on. Now, if these ideas would be too elaborate, they would be so absorbing, you know, for people to, they would be so, you know, consuming, um, you know, uh, that if they would go back to the singer, it would be almost comical. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be fitting. And so these little things, they are just sort of little snippets of, of, of just sort of bursts of little things. Now, when you notice, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, a, a big band playing, for instance, and that's the main backup for bluegrass, you know, I would argue. Um, you can you can see that they're not playing all the time, you know, they're just sort of, there's the whole band playing. And then here comes a little thing and they just go, something like that, you know, something like that. Just a little thing that, just a little thing that sort of comes in and then they don't play at all. And that's how I want to divide it right now. There's actually rhythm and then there's the fills in old bluegrass, you know, uh, so, to, so to speak. So when you uh, look at vamping, you know, that's what we learn. And, and vamping is a good, good thing to learn because you really learn how to play chords, you know, up and down the banjo neck and you really, so it's a good, it's a good exercise. So all the teachers, you know, bug all the students, you know, with how to learn, how to vamp and students say, why do I have to learn that? Well, and then the reason is uh, you play behind people. But why is vamping important, you know, for the sound? It's because it's rhythmic, you know, it's, it has a lot of rhythm. And in the bluegrass band, per se, you know, for, for instance, you have a mandolin playing and a fiddle and, and everybody. So, and the mandolin is doing a very strong offbeat. So you have the bass, boom, and a very strong offbeat on the mandolin. And the guitar in between does both, boom, chuck, boom, chuck, boom, chuck. But if it's loud and it needs to be loud, you, can hear, you can't hear the bass from the guitar uh, that strongly and the offbeat of the guitar you can't hear it that strongly either so with the mandolin you in you you, em, you you put emphasis on the offbeat and with the bass you put emphasis on the beat and with the uh, with, and, uh, and with when, as soon as the mandolin is now playing solo for instance you know well all that emphasis is gone and then the banjo will try to sort of you know take that role or the fiddle you know does it and so that that would be that i have by the way i have my brother uwe here uh today he's he's over here yeah. uh, and oh. and he's he's just he's gonna help me a little bit uh he's, he's gonna <laughs> help me a little bit so when uwe would play a guitar rhythm for instance you know just a, and i would play also the bass and then the offbeat So if you can see that my hand is moving, so why I do why do I do that? I I want to stop the note after I played, and then stop the note again after I play the the offbeat, and I will do that with you know three fingers on on the first three strings, like that. But I don't necessarily need to play that 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 beginning beat. You know, I can also just play the offbeat. You know, one, yeah. You know. I could even I could even do that rhythm by even not playing a chord at all, just damping in the strings. It's just a sound. It's more a sound than it's just a sort of a scratchy sound. And then I can do some variations with my fingers, you know, going. So there's different ways, you know, it's just to add, an, add a little bit of a rhythm. Now I didn't do any fills really, you know, just sort of uh, little fills. And when you see uh, also this, this vamping by itself, this rhythm, um, if you listen to recordings of Bill Monroe, for instance, uh, uh, you can hear that Bill Monroe, sometimes he's singing the chorus and he's not, he's not doing a vamp anymore. Nobody does it. They're just, they're all just singing together. And the rhythm becomes very quiet. It's almost just the bass and the guitar. 
and you can hear the guitar even the guitar gets pretty quiet sometimes and there's not no offbeat going on you know at that at that moment because he's occupied singing and then in the pauses where he doesn't sing he starts playing louder and one of the most obvious things that we were children and we listened to Lester Flat Earl Scruggs play rolling my sweet baby's arms you know you have the chorus rolling my sweet baby's arms rolling my sweet baby's arms yeah so there wouldn't be constant these sound there's no there's not not much dynamic in it and it makes the sound a little boring and that's what you that's what you see most of the times you know when you with the people who just started to learn to vamp they just want to vamp the entire time through but i think it's it's uh, when you look at the music it's like waves it's like rolling with sweet babies boom 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 there's more don't boom there's more again and every time there's more there could be more rhythm, you know, there could be just a little bit more emphasis on rhythm. Now with fills, you gotta be very careful because if you play a fill and at the same time you have a, a fiddle player who plays a fill um, or a dobro player, it can be cluttered, you know, it can become cluttered. That's why uh, we usually say, okay, um, I think, you, are you gonna do in the first verse, you're gonna do the backups, the, the fills? Um, that doesn't really uh, apply, uh, it's not, it doesn't apply for the for the rhythm you know we always try to sort of be with the rhythm but the fills you know so when do we do these fills and we usually try to say okay first verse you know fiddle and that's in traditional bluegrass music and i think this is a very good way of organizing things so in the first fill moment sometimes you can see people looking at each other and going like hey you do the fill and and then once the first fill is done by somebody it's probably going to stay that way for the, for the rest of the verse and uh, and then in the chorus a lot of times it's always the same instrument who does who does the the fills um like in cavern and caroline it's uh, sometimes it's the fiddle and the banjo together you know i wouldn't wouldn't say that's exclusive that either or but they're not playing it likes the the violin maybe does a long a, a long bow and the banjo is has something very staccato against it you know so they're not really doing the same thing and if that once in a while even that would happen it's not the end of the world <laughs> you know sometimes even that can sound good as sort of a cluster or some irritation going on so i don't want to make any hard rules about about these things but uh, but it's important to know that you don't always have to play you know sometimes a rhythm happens in you know as soon as you take the rhythm away the rhythm will happen in the people that's something very interesting so when you when i go Play with you. Thank you. So you can see that the, the more dynamic I, dynamics I put in and try to be with the singer in my dynamic range, it really doesn't matter if I make scratching noises or if I play an actual sort of a figure kind of thing. I, I sort of just help the whole music to be alive. And that's a lot, that, that's the main thing of playing good backup, I think. You, you're not trying to just follow a a rule. For instance, uh, when we start learning backup in bluegrass, we start off a lot of times with really, and now a ro now, now we do a, a, a roll, and then maybe a fill, vamping again. And so. Of course, we have to start somewhere, but if I would just play this through very statically, it wouldn't, most most likely wouldn't make really good, 
good sounding music. Uh, it would sound much better if I just... See that? It's, it's a lot less and I think um, you can really work on that just playing less behind the singer and always trying to stay away from his vocal as much as you possibly can. So I, I want to uh, say that if you want to be inspired for backup licks, of course you can listen to Earl Scruggs and J.D. Crow and all the great banjo players. And uh, especially in the early days, they were, you know, when you listen... These are very swingy kind of, you know, they come out of the swing area. You know, it really swing. And by the way, you know, if you do this lick, you can also play it here. Yeah. <laughs> and then this one. Yeah. And but if you if you if you want to have more ideas you can just go back and listen to a few old uh, Tommy Dorsey uh, uh, rec recordings or uh, some uh, you know great s singers from the 40s and you can see what the what the brass is doing in the back and you can actually use that and put it into bluegrass and it will always it will you know most likely will sound great uh, in the 50s you start having all kinds of you know uh, modalities and things that are not so common for bluegrass but if you want to then uh, uh, learn a few of those, you could definitely in, try to incorporate them just the same, you know. Um, but I think it's a, it's a great source of inspiration uh, um, to actually find new things, you know, that could almost sound like they, you know, have always been there for that kind of music. When Uwe sings, um, um, of course, there's this rolling banjo backup that we use mainly uh, playing, let's say, for fiddle tunes. Uh, there's there's a whole idea of how to play behind a fiddle uh, because you you want to you want to have this this roll you want to have the rhythm you do all these all these different things so these was great so 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 you you just try to try to stay uh, and you do these bass things you know that the bass guitar that a bass would do or a guitar would do try to do that on the banjo things like that like that you know things like that or, and then of course roll that would be that would be very traditional but um, what I do a lot with the banjo and now we're moving a little bit uh, forward in in styles you know I um, what do you do when a guitar player plays plays play, plays a solo and playing a very light vamp there's no more music and then when you play the, a role here there's almost no rhythm and as you just heard when I play closer you know open let's say open strings I play very close to the the fret the, the fretboard up here um, the string vibrates out further and because of that I have more finger pick noises not because of the first strike of the string it's the next one because I gotta stop the string first hear that and when I'm further back I have less finger pick noises but here you see when I play quietly here 
אבל לא צריך קליק, קליק, קליק. There's ways of eliminating that, and uh, I want to show you a little bit uh, of how people have tried to eliminate that. First of all, they have tried to eliminate that by moving their fingers faster. Just, you know, staying in the same rhythm, but the attack is actually quicker. And that, that sort of makes that stopping of the string process quicker and there's less noise. So that's one solution. The other one is that you, you saw in the Scruggs book, you saw that little um, uh, graphic that showed that the finger pick should hit the string straight on, flat on, that the that the, the pedal is really flat against the string. Now, when you have a big surface stopping the string, there's also going to be more sound because you sort of have this whole vibration sort of hitting this flat surface. And But if you, if you had the finger pick a little bit sideways, and th that's an interesting fact now, if you would have looked at, you know, finger picks of uh, John Hickman, um, the, many other, you know, people, you would have seen that they don't play as flat, you know, as straight onto the string as you would think. They maybe play, play a little, ha, they have, the, they have the, the, the pick, you know, strike a little bit with the side. And you can see that a lot of people, you know, playing mandolin or guitar, they don't hit the, the flat pick straight onto the string because you have more noise, you know, stopping the string for the next strike. That's why you see Chris Thiele and other people, you know, playing almost a little sideways, and that's also what, what, what Sierra Hall does, and a lot of people, because you have less, less noise, you know, from the, from, from, the, from the plectrum. And it's the same reason, you know, why some of the people, don't worry about if the, if, 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 if you see this now? See, it doesn't have that much sound because I'm striking the string a little bit with the, more with the side than just flat on. You see that? stopping noise is less. I just wanted to mention that. Now, but basically, it, uh, the sound would be a little bit fuller if it's not played only with the side. The sound of the banjo is mainly, the sound of the, of the finger pick is mainly due to the, to the angle of the, of, the, of the entirety of the hand that strikes the string. If, I, if the string is, you know, moved sideways, like, like sideways, like that, then the string sounds more thin. If the move, if the strings is pushed down a little bit, it the first initial is really like a pop on the string. So you can hear this. It sounds a little thin, and this sounds a lot fuller compared to this. So that's the main reason, you know, why you want to angle the the finger pick a little bit. But for backup here, I go very close to the bridge a lot of times, and I play very quietly. When Uwe plays guitar solo. Now, what I do is I stay away from I stay away from a lot of movement. I say I don't play. I don't have much melodic movement. I just sort of try to stay as, mono, as uh, monotonous as I probably can, as I as I can. And, So now the ear will always go where the movement of the music is going. And so the banjo can be actually quite loud, and, um, but as long as it doesn't do any movement, well, the attention will not stay with it. And that's a great thing because I can make now a lot of sound without disturbing the guitar. But as soon as I start playing things like that, I, my intention goes straight to me. So I try to stay away from all of these little things. And, 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 that's, and that's just very important. So for a D chord, a lot of times I just use this, this A and just, just play these three notes. And then occasionally a fifth string. And then for the G here. And then the C. And I leave the D string open a lot of times. But there again, I try to stay from 
and even even not for the change of the chords and such you know just little just basic slide into the funda fundamental node maybe that maybe maybe that but not not much other and if i want to uh, disappear the most i try to stay away from the thirds of the of the chord the third is this one here right the, the, the b and g or the e and c that's the third or in d it would be that f sharp or in e it would be that g sharp or in a that's c sharp so i try to stay away from these a little bit because they they always stick out like a sore thumb you can always hear them really really well and sometimes it's just good you know if you want to disappear in the sound that means you want to still play quite loud but you don't want to disturb stay a little stay away from these thirds if you want to make a statement more you know of where the chord is actually going you want to try to get these thirds that's that's the other side you want to say it's so like i you play salty dog blues <laughs> C third. Now I did it on every chord. Doesn't need to be, but 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 you could hear the chord really well. You could hear how how well it you can you can recognize it. Now when you would go back in history and you look at Bach, you know Bach would build a lot of melodies starting on the third because the bass would already uh, play you know the the fun fundamental note or um you would you know so you would start maybe on the five or on the third uh you know of the chord you know playing a melody but not necessarily on the root because it would and the third and the five already de defy um the the chord really really well you don't need the fundamental you know for instance you have a, a e uh, an E chord, so you have a, a G sharp, right, and and uh, and and a B. That really sounds like a an, an E chord without without having that E note. And the same is true for an A chord. You know, you have the the third here, and then and then you have the fifth. You have the E that already sounds a lot like an A chord, and you don't have the the, fu the fundamental note. I'm just saying, that's. It's only it's always a question of vis of uh, audibility. Do you want to be? Um, do you want to enhance the chords that you can hear them better, or you just want to stay out of the way and just sort of be be quieter? Um, then you just want to limit yourself maybe to the one and to the five of the chords. You know, don't play as many thirds. Uh, that works really well. A lot of times, when there is a pause, you know, and, and Uwe can sing, um, uh, Uwe sings a song, and then there is a pause. All I need to to be uh, for 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 anybody sort of to get the attention to the banjo is just play a little louder. The same thing I have already done. I don't have to necessarily be really adventurous. Um, it's very annoying, you know. For instance, if you know, if uh, Uwe would sing, you know, my home's across the Blue Ridge Mountain. My home's across the Blue Ridge Mountain. <laughs> you know, oh, oh, you know, why did he do that? And that actually happened a lot in the 70s, when this melodic style, this chromatic, they call it, you know, when it was bluesy fast, um, it was in, you know, everybody would just constantly fill everything full. And uh, until everybody got so sick of it, you know, nobody, nobody, and it was so... Uh, disturbing to the words, to the sound, you know, to everything, um, that there was a complete return to the style of Terry Bochum at one point where people said, okay, we want that. I thought that worked better, you know. <laughs> so so just, you know, try to stay uh, musically uh, tasteful in a way that you see what is, what is the main focus in the song. And if the song, of course, is a fiddle tune, it's the fiddle. Uh, and then while the fiddle is playing, you have to make sure that you don't take away from that effect that the fiddle is trying to achieve and the same with the singer uh, and i have to have to admit you know i've done many experiments that didn't work you know with backup because while backupping you try things and then you see oh it didn't really work you know i really played into Uwe singing here or that really or that really didn't wasn't the way i expected it to be but but that's okay as long as you as long as you realize it you know as long as you 
try to um, um, you know evaluate what you just did maybe that that's a good idea so what I do a lot like I said is playing these playing playing and it's almost like you had a banjo played really loud but you turned the volume down in the mix Uwe can maybe play a rhythm for me so if I go here if I play it really quietly the banjo almost disappears you can't really hear it that well and when I play it louder it takes away all the space see when I go in here it almost sounds like a banjo in the distance and it gives you a great rhythm so just don't play it loud that would be but you could even go you see here we play solo here on this in this level but then you go really back you know even further back than you would play solo and just play very lightly and so so a lot of times for backup I would play here the solo yeah. You know, and they play the back up here. So you can see that I actually, you know, it's a it's a different effect. Don't 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 hesitate going very close to the bridge and do a really light roll, and you you can hear that banjo, you know, like a railroad track from the distance. You know, it's like. You know. That's a little machine. Sounds actually really, really beautiful. Okay, then what I what I also do I th uh, comes in very handy for me is I that I um, play with dampened notes, um, where I take the, the palm of my hand and put it on my put it on the bridge. So when I, yeah, let's, let's see, you see if I have a D chord. So this next, I'm going to show you an example in D. So all I do is I'm playing this D chord here. Just the second string, the third string, and the low string. So I've never played the first string. I just go in these middle ones. And now the technique is that I, that I play, the, or I can, this is all dampened. Or when I do chords, I can just lift the hand so we... with anything else, just just that. So the first impulse is damped, dampened, and then I take the string the hand away and just let it ring. In that muffled sort of idea. So let's let's do a little bit of people get ready. So you, you also maybe notice that I don't play all the chords, you know. I sort of stay on this and just use this this six here for the four. That means for the G chord, which is that would be a G chord, and for the and for the D, and then for the A, I just stay because it gives me an A suspended. That D gives me an A suspended. So the fundamental, the fifth and the, and the one again. I can almost use as a drone, you know, for, th throughout everything. And just to give it a little color, I just put an occasional sixth in here. But I don't really care about the chord structure. I just try to sort of emph emphasize my idea of, you know, just here it needs a little bit of an extra color. And then in the end, I played the E minor, but I could also play this E minor with an E minor seven, and then play, a, and play an A again. So, can you show that again how you dampen the front yeah. of the 
camera so that people actually see what you're doing with your left hand, yeah. right hand? Yeah, I just put the palm on my hand and then lift it up. It's pretty close to the bridge, aren't Yeah, you? I put the hand on the bridge. See, I like that. I just, and, and then I take the hand away. And you can practice that a little bit, just... So it doesn't sound like that. All right. So now I can add a few like instant like like uh, fill notes, like little f one of these fillers, you know. So let's say I have this. So people get ready. So I didn't think about a lot of chords really, <laughs> I just sort of things, um, just little fills, you know, I can think like notes that I like here, the C note is a, is a very cool note, you know, it gives me a little bit of a blues, I can also play it here, but here's the... kinds of you know um, um, things that I could fill now this I, I could do these bluesy kind of fills and just just sometimes a, just one note is a fill you see that's that's just enough it doesn't it doesn't take more because you have the melody da 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 ba da 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 ba da ka ba doi ka that's enough don't need a whole lick you know don't need all that just 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 a little subtle thing uh, or just moving even up the neck da 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 Okay. Uh, you are an open G tuning. I question here. Yes, but I'm an open G tuning. I didn't even put the fifth string on the on. It. But I play when I play out of D. I play a lot of times. I put the I put the cape. I put the you know the fifth string on A. I like that. It gives me a little bit more freedom, you know, with the fifth with the fifth string. Now. If you, if the, the first thing you know, I would always suggest, and I see that I see that actually a lot, is that people play a, a, a tune on the banjo, especially a fiddle tune or, or something, and then they need to play back up, and they don't know the chord structure to it. And it's very important to to know the chord structure. Um, not that you necessarily always need to play exactly that chord structure, because like I said, everybody else is already doing it. But it is good to know it very important i think uh, uh so when you learn salt creek and you learn all these you know go hit the hitter go yonder or what you know blackberry blossom be interesting for you to understand you know this is <laughs> So, so in a in a in a in a song like that, you know, where I try to to help Uwe play better. You know, if I would then really just vamp the chords. It, 
it can sound a little static you know it's just a little uh, i don't know it just doesn't really need it that much i think tony rice was one of the first ones who abandoned the banjo in acoustic music really when he started you know with the album manzanita and stuff you know where's the banjo you know that's when i thought and it's a lot of times because the banjo would either roll or vamp there was not much in between at uh, uh, in those days you know uh, and i and also the banjo had always the sound you know it was very right in your face so it was like either, either it would vamp or it would roll and um, um and I think just in a, in, a, in, a, in a tune like that, you could also play these chords on the one. You don't need to have it on the off, off on the offbeat. You know, it sounds. Mm -hmm. then you mix it up you make sort of a rhythm when you look at Earl Scruggs and Earl Scruggs book, he had this rhythm he had all kinds of rhythms that he would do behind the band um, he called rum rumba rhythm <laughs> something I can't remember something he called and I always thought why that I never heard that later all of a sudden I realized he does it all the time you know he played it all the time he played all these little these little intricate rhythms you know that that uh, I didn't even think they were there in bluegrass music. And uh, and so when I play behind Uwe, I try to fill the sound, you know, with, with a little bit of offbeat, a little bit of chords, a little bit of everything, you know. <laughs> So, so I, I think that sort of makes it almost a little bit like an accordion guitar or something. All right, I'm talking way too long. Uh, Uwe shows me the, the, the watch. All right, so, um, so I think, uh, what else? You know, I'm doing a lot of fills with five over one. You know, that's what I do. I play the five chord. I mean, that's like I say, I'm in D. I do a lot of chords that just the, the, the A chord. And then just go to D, you know, e even though I'm not, nobody's playing that chord, but it sounds really good. That's why we have, we have, you know, we have, we have like, a, people get ready, get, there's a train You hear that? So, so I play, there's no, there's just, it goes, just goes back to the D, but I play a five. And that gives you a tension, that gives a tension, just a chord tension, um, that nobody else has to do. I'm just doing it alone. Let's do it one more time. People get ready. Yeah. Or I could even do a roll kind of thing, you know. People get ready. One of my favorites. Anyway, so I think uh, that being said, this is pretty much what I do in 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 backup. And we could go back, you know, and have some have some question and answer time just a little bit. We have, a, I think, we have another twenty minutes you, or something. You had a uh, you had a question about how to avoid noise. You answered that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was also a question of uh, you, there's a lot of in inspiration from swing riffs. Are there also rock and roll riffs that are? In <laughs> yes. Question? Yeah, so many questions and so so little time. Uh, Uwe is doing a really good job moderating over there. I like it. So yeah, yeah. He can have my job. No, no, it's, it's all right. <laughs> so, uh, what do you think? Yeah, well, the, the the one question I want to answer, you know, the, there's little blues, you know, stuff, you know, uh, sure. uh, uh, or swing, you know, is there rock and roll? Yes, of course. You know, whatever you can, or even chicken pick and stuff. <laughs> You know, whatever you hear from a telecaster or whatever you, inspires you um, is great. You know, now these days they took the telecaster a lot of times. They took the telecaster out of country music. You know, there's a lot of new country music that doesn't have all of these solos going on because they figured 
it's too much you know a lot of people just don't even want to hear that anymore because they can't distinguish one from the other so they said okay let's nuke it all together it's kind of sad but it's just the way it is you know it's was, it was a little overdone i suppose um but i think that uh, you know especially in the 80s country music you know with um, um, um what is it, Randy Travis, you know, and, you know, oh, yes. the, Alan Jackson, these people, they had one, some of the best, you know, backup players, and they would just be so tasteful. And there again, I think one of my greatest inspiration to to experimenting on banjo with different kinds of backup was Jerry Douglas. I mean, really, I, he's not that I have, I don't have the possibilities of sliding, but his melody approach to 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 backup. When he especially when he played with the whites, you know, in the early 80s, he would take a regular song, and of course, they were playing they're singing like angels and you know with, with their dad and but jerry douglas would always you know so many times would come up with a hook just a little backup hook that would make this entire song not just a song it would make it a hit and i i saw the power that a backup lick a good one can have and uh, jerry douglas there is this just almost ultimate taste musical taste uh, people like bobby hicks you know all these greats you can see that they had wonderful beautiful backup ideas that made the music so much better and then they just disappear they're not there anymore jerry douglas is one of these great examples he doesn't play all the time but then he comes like a he comes like a fish out of the water you know just like a rainbow fish and just comes out and just makes everything colorful and bright and then he just disappears again and that yeah. uh, was always something that inspired me you know uh, uh, whatever you know, inspires you, you should, you but, know, and, and you touched on it a couple of times. Like, I think the overarching kind of thing for this whole session is to keep it tasteful, right? Uh, it, very it, much, you know, it's, it's really about just keeping what you're doing as a, in the backup thing, just, just listening to what music needs rather than what you can play. Exactly. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. when, when you start and when I, you know, when we still played on the streets, I learned something new, I would incorporate it in every solo, you know, I would I would have a lick, and I would try to fit it in, in every solo because I was not really in a concert situation. All I wanted to be able was to was to be able to play. Then it was a good practice for me but it wasn't very musical i would say you know um but it developed of course you know i was i was playing it and then i thought oh this wasn't that good or or somebody would even tell me you know stop playing while i'm singing or something <laughs> so there's a we've got a number of comments and questions and definitely yes. um a lot of people talking about um just back up in general and, and wesley walker shares one which is interesting and got some people's attention on the youtube chat and he says, confession, sometimes for backup, I play a very quiet version of whatever I think I will play for my upcoming break. You could call it real time practice, which I thought was pretty ingenious. And so did a lot of other people. Um, Keen well, to hear actually, your, your thoughts on that. Well, I think this is very nice as long as it sticks, you know, enough to the to the to the to the vo to the vocal. You know, sometimes it's it's difficult, you know, if the vocal sings this sort of melody and then the banjo follows it. And then leave somewhere completely different, uh, you know, somewhere, you know, and, and you don't know who to follow anymore. And that that is a little bit difficult, especially when you're in the same sort of range. There's a lot of times, you know, where, you, where the banjo, uh, where actually I also play very close to Uwe's vocal. And then I try to stay with it a little bit, you know, I don't. Uh, and then maybe just go somewhere else, but I make a sort of a pause first. I don't try to take people on a on my journey don't don't take it away it's like bad manner you know when you're in a on a table and somebody's t telling a story and somebody else sort of just takes it over you know and and that's that that's the same that can happen and it's not a it's not a problem but if it happens a lot it's really not that it starts to be a little uh, annoying yeah but i think it's a it's a legit thing you know to try to play that solo uh, in the background and have it have it a little bit as a solo but i wouldn't do it as a serious backup probably you know i would do it as a, in a jam session maybe or uh, but not in a yeah. but then again it's the joy of music right it's whatever whatever we can do uh to improve which is cool um a lot of people also talking about janet davis does have a really good book yes that's appropriately what... titled backup yeah. banjo i believe yeah, that's so, what I, I mentioned that in the beginning, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to drop the mm. link. I dropped it in the YouTube chat already. I'll, I'll throw mm. it in the Facebook one for you. It's on Amazon, on Kindle, and hardback, and however you want to get it. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, Ellen Torrop asked an interesting question. How do these ideas apply to old time and claw hammer? Well, a lot of times, you know, old time music doesn't really have backup. They all play the melody at the same time throughout the entire song. 
um, there's not that much, you know, sort of backup. Uh, unless you have a singer like Uncle Dave Macon who, you know, plays a solo and then uh, he, while he's singing, he doesn't play the same thing. He sort of just plays, um, uh, just plays sort of the, the chord structure, you know, with the, with the, with the strum, you know. And, and when Uwe, Uwe sings a song at Doc Watson, Doc Watson, you know, even if we had, let's say, a Shady Grove and you look at Doc Watson, he would always, he, almost, he, he would play the solo pretty much over his singing because it was so close to his singing, right, in old time. But let's say um, in, in Clawhammer, you wouldn't have that kind of sort of, first of all, you don't have any swing. You know, old time, old time music is straight music. You know, it, it, there's not... There's no dotted rhythm much in old time music. I mean, almost none. And uh, so it's pre-swing music, music. And so it's pretty straightforward. And it has, you know, sort of, um, um, uh, let's say a fiddle tune. The banjo will probably not play exactly every note that the fiddle plays. So, but all the, co all the corner ideas, you know, and sort of be with the fiddle with the corner ideas while keeping a rhythm. And sort of they they work together. It's almost like Irish music, you know, where everybody's playing at once, and um, and and not, you know, uh, particularly you know, particular backup and such. Um, and there again, if there's a if it's a singing song in old time music, you you would have you know uh, a few different uh, simplifications, I would say, you know, but just keep the rhythm going and that sound going of the banjo. Thank you, Jens. Um, all right, Gigito, um, who's a regular Daring Live viewer as well. He has it's a it's a two part question, I think. So sometimes I feel like the way I play banjo runs very parallel in the same direction to all the other instruments. I feel like I need to add a few more notes to the chord to create almost melodic paths in the accompaniment. Could you give some tips to do this well? Well, yeah, I, I, I well, I. To do this well, I don't know. Um, uh, I think my, one of my main things I do is I do, I stay stagnant. That means I do an ostinato, uh, and ostinato means like a rep repetitive uh, phrase. That's an ostinato. And what I do a lot of times is I just play a ninth chord over something, and 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 that always. Okay, you, you can create tension by going in another direction. You can also create tension by just not moving, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and and that's, that's a wonderful thing of, of creating something different because you're not moving. Uh, so, so let's say Uwe, Uwe would sing, uh, Uwe would sing um, let's say, a piece called... Uh, So it's, it would be F, E flat, B flat, F, E flat, F, and then four. So I could play that, you know, these chord structures always is four, five, four, one, four, one, four, one, you know, four, five, one, and play that all the time. And uh, uh, but in order to create sort of a, a sense, I can just stay on this B. It's in B flat, so I'm on the third fret here, and I'm add, just adding the the nine, which is you know the second note, you know, add. add. In, in jazz, you call a ninth chord usually one that also has a flat with seven, you know. Um, so it's an add to, you know. So I, I add this C note here, and I can, I could add it here while keeping the third, or I could eliminate the third by putting it down to C and get this B flat nine chord E, just like this. So Uwe can now change all the chords, and I don't have to. And I still have the fifth string with the G, so I give a, I have a B flat and a G, which makes a B flat nine six chord. You know. So. I feel the cold wind in my face. I know that I'm all alone. I can feel the lights. All the stars light up in the sky. They're guiding me around the world as I pull the ring in time. My sails look like the wings of angels gliding through the night. Thank you. 
okay. I think you get the idea. You, you saw how little I did, and the music actually create. There was more tension because with every chord, Uwe changed. My chord changed. This chord, it changed what it was because the foundation of this chord changed. You know, in B flat, it's a B flat nine, and then of course in F, it's a it's a F suspended. You know, and, and so forth. So every chord has its it becomes a new chord because I just don't move. And that's the nice thing about an ostinato, you know, that you can sometimes just sort of imply. The other thing is I, um, uh, like you ask, you know, for melodic lines, you know, that could sort of, you know, enhance. Um, uh, there, you know, you just got to know a little bit what the other guys are doing, you know, so, so you can actually have something. I think melodic lines are usually used, you know, to move from one point to another. Uh, so if you have let's B flat for instance and then you want to go to F right so then you want to try to get into the F with a with a melodic line or you want to go to into, into this E flat you know yeah. okay so I have B flat so it's B flat B flat but da da F but then E flat B flat, right? So I have this. Uh... Maybe and that's a lot. But, but it wasn't just random melody. I always used a melodic idea to get into another chord and, and use, it, use it as, you know, as, as people would use a bass note. But as a melodic line, you know, in the upper register, trying to get into the chord in a different way, in an interesting way, and leading into the chord. And that gives that melody a purpose. If it wouldn't move into a chord and it's just a melody for the sake of some melody, uh, it just doesn't a lot of times it's just very hard to to give it a purpose really and if it moves into another chord structure it always feels like it's musical yeah i hope that was a, that was a that was a pretty robust answer I, I wonder how many people were like me and just forgot what we were talking about for a second there and <laughs> drifted off into uh, into what you guys were doing it's, it's amazing uh right we've got time for a couple more um sandy de vera I hope I pronounced that correctly. What do you do when you try something in backup and it doesn't work? How do you redeem yourself in the jam? It's a good question for all those people who are kind of new to backup and trying to trying to master it, I guess. I think I just, you know, I don't know. If, if I, I constantly, it constantly happens to me. I try something and I don't think it's a good, so I back off, you know, I become a little quieter, <laughs> try to rethink my, my position, you know, and try to come in back again. I find uh, to tell you something that I haven't mentioned before. I try. I find the most difficult thing is when you try something that you still stay in rhythm. Okay, so in the moment you lose the rhythm, you get faster, you get slower. You're not with the pack anymore. Nothing you play will sound good. That's that's just fact and it's also disturbing to the others you know because there's a a groove going so i let's say i look at the b flat and i want to go and i think okay what am i going to do what am i going to do okay i'm going to go to this e flat and i'll just stay in g for now I'm just sorry we've just been in that song so we don't have to stay in b flat. but let's say we're in g all right and i want to go to g i want to i'm g i'm in here and now uh, i'm going to go to the c and and while i'm playing i think what could i do what could i do and then my attention actually goes to the future or some idea and my, i'm not with the music anymore and it can very easily happen that i'm now starting to drift away and then i play a lick and that lick just doesn't it's not good because it's out of time and out of sync with everybody else and that's actually a big problem same when you're rolling and you're going into a vamp the vamp can be much faster all of a sudden or you're just not in time and it's not the vamp that's bad it's the it's the timing that's not so good and and a lot of times you get away with some crazy musical ideas as long as they're in time i i that's my one of my experiences and if i um play something that doesn't seem to be 
in place well it's not it's not the end of the world especially not in the jam session you know i just uh, i i i just um, you know I, I i just try again you know i just uh, usually try to get quieter or smile on the round you know or look at uve and say ah, i know that it didn't work that well so make him feel okay that he doesn't have to worry i'm going to do this from now on all the time or something <laughs> <laughs> but, but i think I, I would i would say that's that's a really that's what i was thinking too like if you're in a jam i think it's better to try it and and not quite get there than mm -hmm. just be so reserved and never try it at all yeah right? absolutely absolutely make, make the mistake absolutely. and build on it right absolutely and there's a good yeah. there's, a, there's a good chance if you tap your foot you know that you don't lose the the the, the rhythm so much and you have more freedom of thinking of melodic things you want to do right yeah. Yeah. yeah, a jam is a jam. You're not you're not playing in front of uh, 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 the, a massive ten yeah, thousand crowd. So. It's exactly, and I think there's a definite difference, you know, between trying uh, be, between trying to find out and trying to actually arrange something. If you are in a sort of a semi-professional band or just a mm -hmm. fun band, and you're working on a song, and you think like, how could I improve this back? I'm really practice it, and yeah. there's a difference, you know, because then you don't want to just experiment. You want to know a little bit more, you know, of how you do it. And there's a big danger that you go home and then you work out this really amazing backup and then you go in the band and you just try to plow it in there. And sometimes it just, uh, it usually, you realize that, oh, I practiced way too much. There's way too much stuff. I don't need all that. I just, I can really, really tone it down. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Um, right. So top of the hour, I'm going to do one more. Um, yeah, one more question. Yeah. And, uh, this, is from, this is from Rudy. Rudy is my my secret honey supplier uh, from Florida. Thank yep. you, Rudy. So this is, a, this is a pretty long question, but let's go for it. There's a lot of emphasis on using tab and learning songs by note. I think that's us. Uh, going to the sixth, for example, requires that one knows where the scale degrees are in the chord. On the piano, this is easier to see, but not so on the banjo. What is one thing you can suggest to begin to learn the next, sorry, the neck in this way? I think is what he means. Yes, there's, I, I, th I, you know, there's a lot of discussion, you know, about learning scales and all that, and that's and that's all very, very good. But I found that, you know, even though that's all true, that scales and arpeggios learning and all that is is very tr is is very important. I and I always have done it, but I still see that most musicians, you know, including Doc Watson, you know, and and most people that I uh, or BB King. Eric Clapton, you know, they they look at a chord and inside that chord they start to remember where a certain other note is, you know. It's like, for instance, if you look at this F chord, this F position chord in G, and then all of a sudden you realize that that flat, flat at 7 is down here. Or here. You know, or here. Here on the second string. So you know that, and then all of a sudden you realize, okay, this is the six. And this is the four. Okay, this is the three, this is the two, one. Then you have them all already. And then all of a sudden, you you know, they come one by one. It, it, it seems like you remember them one by one, you know? So again, and if I have the F position here, uh, the six is here, because here's the seven. Of course, you know, when you, you have to know the scale, you know, you, you, you have to know the scale. And there's a there's also a very nice way of remembering scales, for instance. If you look at a G, you know, that's two, 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 one, and that's called the tetrachord. I don't know why it's called chord, but it's a tetrachord. And it's a G tetrachord. And then when you start that on a D note, for instance, it's a D tetrachord. And if you combine a G tetrachord and a D tetrachord, you're gonna get a G scale. And the next half of the of the scale is already D. If I would go on, the next one is an A. So and and if the next one would be an E, and the next one would be a B, and the next one would be F sharp. So it's a circle of fifths that just goes around. Now there again, you would know need to know what is a circle of fifths and blah blah. You know it's, but I would suggest you know that basic understanding of just what is a scale what notes are in a g scale you don't and you know i know so many people say learn the g scale and then learn them in all keys i don't think so it's like 
learn the word for tree and now learn it in all languages. You know, I, I think to communicate, you know, just learn it in one language. And that's the same. Learn the key of G really well. And once you learn the key of G really well, you you can then also learn the key of D really well. Actually, fairly easy. Uh, you don't you don't need to, you know, all, always overwhelm yourself with way too much information. You know, it's not that necessary. Learn G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, you know, just, yeah, just play the G chord, uh, G scale, and then know that the, the one, the three, and the five is the chord, and then learn the other notes. And then if you have an, this this F chord here, you know, this F position, you know, this is the four, and this is the three, this is the, the, the seven, flat seven, the six, the seven, you know, you start to, not from Monday to Tuesday, but slowly, and then the same thing here. Here's the seven, here's the six, you know, and then and then you have one more. You have this one, the six, six is here, and and and, and so forth. And then once you're done, this is actually doesn't take that long. It only takes, you know, uh, a little bit of thinking about it, a little using, and then you know it just as well as on a piano, I would argue. That's an extremely good answer. Jens, we did it. The first We'd... episode back. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank oh. you. Thank you all out in, 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 in beautiful uh, 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 the, the cyber land uh, that, we, 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 that you listen to me or uh, be with me and uh, have patience with my English. <laughs> so, we, so we got a few. I mean, you gave me five or six, I think, episodes. I'm yes. sure we'll add some more, but over, we're going to do this every three ish kind of weeks, I think. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. We both yeah. got travel schedules, so it will, it will vary. There's no fixed time for them yet. Yes, but right. We're going to get into some tunings in yeah. an episode. We're going to get into some improv improvisation. Can't sure. Say that word, apparently. Um, and then uh, creating your own style. And then we're going to get in some more kind of banjo setup and live recording. Yeah. And I'm sure, yes. Jens, across the way, you'll come up with some other kind of concepts, as will we. Um, but that was really, really fun. Lots I, of good people. I, I had a great time. And I want to also I, uh, thank my brother, Uwe, for helping yes. me out here. Thank and, you, Uwe. Uh, that, was, that was really cool. And uh, so you all take care. And if you have questions, you can always also write me directly to our office at Double Time uh, Music. You know, just go to Kruger Brothers homepage. And if or go to Deering and ask them, or they're they gonna send me the, the the email forward. If there's a real pressing question, I'm I'm always glad to help. All right, we definitely will, and we'll see you in a few weeks. We we'll just booked our flight, so we'll see you at Melfast in a few weeks. Anyway. All right, I'm looking forward um, to it. Hey, would you guys mind? Do you mind doing a quick jam to see us out? Yes, absolutely. Do you we mind? Can, we, can, we can play something. You can. Out, you, yeah. I want to see some real solid backup now. Yes. Really, really solid yeah. backup. What it's backup really could we play? Backup. You know, so. Um, Let's play um da 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 you know <laughs> uh, Thank you everybody for watching. We'll see you next time. Take it away guys.